So uh, I'm going to show two clips that for me were pretty definitive uh, moments in Third Strike history. All right. The first one, we'll, we'll do Justin Wong versus Takedo at uh, EVO 2002, the first EVO ever. Okay. So uh, this is notable for a couple of reasons. Uh, but first off, Third Strike at EVO 2002, and we might have actually watched this on stream before. Third Strike mm -hmm. at EVO 2002, it was so unpopular at the time that they didn't run an open bracket for it. You could enter Super Turbo. Oh, wow. You could enter Alpha 3. You could enter CBS 2. You could, run Mar you could enter Marvel 2. Third Strike was a 5v5 USA versus Japan. So it didn't, huh. it didn't even have a bracket. This is 2002. I believe the game came out in 1999 and it had just kind of been like, I don't know, shit on basically. Like there was a dude, I remember there was a dude at the barricade. His name was Paul Kim and everyone kind of made fun of him because he liked third strike. Um, like he, he once uh, rode his bike to take Caltrain all the way up to, I think it was either Folsom or Sacramento so that he could go to a third strike tournament because he saw that there's a local there. He shows up. And they actually weren't going to run the bracket, but because he made it, oh, wow. they, he, they, they ran it out of sympathy and he got like fourth out of six people. Oh, like that's, that's, that's third strike back then. Right. It, it like the chads were playing Marvel two or CVS two or whatever, but nah, third strike. That was some fucking, some whatever shit. Right. So this is Takedo versus Justin Wong. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Third strike, y'all. Take your first pick. <laughs> it's fine that this is in, like, 16p. Yeah. Because you can tell exactly what's happening. Wait, hold up, though, okay? I had to pay good money for a DVD with this fucking footage, all right? I, that, that was a fucking, I shelled out. That was a birthday present. I had to send Tom and Tony Cannon like 50 bucks or something. And that got in the mail like months later, all right? The fact that this is recorded at all was a fucking godsend. And you know what? At least yeah. it was a DVD. Because for B5, <laughs> they had to get fucking VHS tapes for that shit. You think I want to buy a VHS tape? Oh my God. Anyway, then this happens. So the reason this works, by the way, what, what he hit him with was a bunch of Urian unblockables that I think most of the United States probably wasn't, were, were not that aware that it, they existed at the time. But basically, my understanding is the reason this works is Urian has a super called Aegis Reflector. He puts out this big pink square on the screen, right? And Aegis Reflector is nominally a, a projectile reflector, right? So if you throw a fireball at it, it'll bounce right back and hit you. Um, but... People actually forget that it does that because the more use, the more utility it has is just this persistent projectile that hangs around for a long time. But what's important about it is the side, the, the side that Urian is does it on, right? So he Urian's standing on the one player side, which means you have to block the this Aegis reflector as though he was on the one player side, even after Urian moves to the two player side. So he does this, Justin's blocking, gets opened up by the overhead. Okay, whatever. This is the unblockable here. So Dash is back, right? Justin is about to fly into this thing. Bounces him back. He does this cross up, pops him out of the corner, does this cross up, right? While Urian is moving over him, he's or, or over Justin, Urian's doing it with this knee drop move that he crossed up. So you have to block it the other way. But the projectile, the Aegis Reflector, you still have to block in the original direction. And that's why it's unblockable. So then he gets the hit. And, oh, he built another meter. Guess we're gonna do it again.
So you can kind of hear the tide change already, right? Like, it starts mm. off and people are like, lol, this game sucks. You know, we're watching dudes whiff buttons to build meter for the first 30 seconds of this match, right? <laughs> oh my God. Like, why would you play this when you could play anything else? And then you see some cool shit that you don't understand. You see some anime shit, right? What other fight, what other Street Fighter game is let you just park a projectile on top of somebody and mix them ruthlessly for like, you know, several seconds at a time and let you stock multiple of those at once, right? Mm -hmm. The Street Fighter did not typically do this kind of thing. Yeah, you know, it is actually really interesting how, despite how like polarizing and like, how much the, the the parry system like um, messes with your standard idea of like fun fundamentals are, mm -hmm. and how I don't think almost no game has tried to do something similar to that. Yes, like, anyone else that has even tried to make parry a, a significant feature of their game mm -hmm. has like specifically put in stuff to prevent. They take the shit, coward's like, way out. Happening. You, you know, have recovery yeah. animations and shit like that, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the cow you can call Howard's way out, or you could say, <laughs> what if we had that but also had a game? But the, <laughs> I think that, um, what if we had Perry and, 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 and more? But, like, it's, it's, it's really interesting how, like, some of the weird degen shit, like, ha is super influential. Like, I know Urian is not known as, like, the top is top tier, you know, like he's he's considered uh, very high, but yeah, he's considered very high. He's not like at the 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 absolute tip, but like, um, he I feel like he has like a pretty significant influence on a lot of fighting game design afterwards. Like mm -hmm. maybe like more even than some of these other characters. Oh yeah, but like his weird like, um, like his use of project like the Aegis reflector specifically, mm -hmm. like. Schoolgirls just made a character that has a uh, basically Aegis reflector in it. Like Umbrella has has <laughs> uh, a super. I know about it because I spent a while uh, writing lines for that one. There you go. But like, uh, it's it absolutely was like. In fact, we we spent a long time coming up with naming schemes so that it would be um, easy enough for people to say and remember mm -hmm. without them defaulting to just calling Aegis reflector. Right. Because if you make the name too like off off the beaten path, they're just gonna call it Aegis Reflector. Yeah, which is why it's called like Retina Reflector. If you ever um, want something that will win over the hearts of maybe a dozen people who are on who remember it from Show Recon forums, uh, the the meme for a while was you want pain Aegis Reflector. Uh, so if you ever get a chance to make Umbrella say <laughs> you want pain, it'll it'll warm the hearts of some old old. old oh men. shit. Damn. <laughs> Um, alternately, you could do umbrellas in the club doing Aegis Reflector. That's that, that's the <laughs> other one. All right. So now we're going to watch Evo Moment 37. And I th we've done this on stream before, um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and and we'll just we'll just run through it real quick. Um, but put yourself, re rewind yourself to 2004, right? Uh, it is hot, hot, hot out in Cal Poly Pomona, which is... If you've never been there, it's in the Inland Empire of, of Southern California, which is to say it is significantly far inland from most of the stuff that you think of when you think of Southern California. And it's about 15 to 20 degrees hotter than it is on like Santa Monica or something in West LA, right? So everyone is fucking roasting and we're inside in the in the the, the dark air conditioned uh, Pomona, Cal Poly Pomona. I want to say it was called like the Galileo Ballroom or something like that, which at that point was probably the biggest fighting game venue that any anyone in North America had ever been in, at least for an NA event, right? Um, I went back to it uh, in, I think it was, what, 20, 2015? I, I think it must've been 2014, because I think it's the 10 year anniversary and Watts ran an event out there called Evo, uh, called Moment 37 Reloaded. And I remember thinking, wow, the ballroom felt so much bigger back then, but now it's like kind of like a mid-sized event. Like you could, it, I think I think we, we had probably more floor space for Wednesday Night Fights Oakland. Um, but back then, 
you're a you're a young Patrick Miller. You just finished up your freshman year of college, so you've been living on your own for a little bit, uh, and you are out on your second the second road trip of your life. The first being the you know the first Evo that I went to, which is Evo 2003. But now you're you're you you you've got your freshman year behind you. You can kind of talk to girls. Actually, you have a girlfriend at this point, which is very impressive. You never thought you'd do it. Um, <laughs> and you're you're at evo but you you entered third strike because you picked it up a little bit but you don't really play it you're not really into this game and you're fucking hungry as shit so you went and got some carl's jr and came back and you're just sitting in the back of this room waiting for some fucking cvs2 or some marvel a game that you care about while you're stuffing your face with this fucking kind of whatever uh famous star combo meal okay so you got your mouth full of food at this point your hands are all smelling a hamburger and then you look up and you see this Except for the cool pre-roll, because Evo didn't have production value like that back then. Rare footage of Daigo actually angry. So, to start with, if you remember where we were two years ago at Evo 2002, the idea, at least on the West Coast, I had no idea that Justin was playing Third Strike seriously. And so the idea that Justin would actually have gotten good enough at Third Strike to challenge Japanese players, like I fully expected top eight or top whatever, I think this is in top eight, uh, to be all Japan all the time, because I didn't really know there was much of a scene for, uh, for Third Strike in, in North America. All I remembered was that clip of Justin getting dusted by Takedo, right? So the thought, mm that Justin could not only be good enough at this game to make top eight and to beat multiple Japanese players, but actually to be, I want to say he's, he beat Rao to get, to get into this match with Daigo. Right. And so you can hear Seth kind of uh, hyping it up a little bit, like giving it a little bit of narrative context to make it spicy. And also apparently the fact that he grabbed a camera at all, I think it was, I want to say it was James Chen's camera. It was running low on battery and like, I, I don't know what it was that prompted him to just start rolling this stuff, but like it was, it was in this, like he wasn't recording everything. He grabbed this specifically because he, th he, he had a premonition or something. I don't know. And yes, that's, that's Seth Killian narrating the action right now. The iconic, let's go, Justin. So when you get to this part and you look at those health bars, you're like, every, as soon as, as, as soon as Justin gets a meter here, right? You see it right here. Get the parry, trades. You look at this health and you're just like, I know what this motherfucker is going to do. Everyone knows what this motherfucker is going to do. <laughs> He's going to do the Chun-Li super because it does like hella hits, right? No one's ever going to parry this whole thing. You're going to get hit by one or you're going to get chipped out. And it's so fast, right? So he's whiffing the button because he's trying to bait a reaction, but also because he's trying to buffer the startup of the super so that you don't see the crouch forward, walk forward, crouch, walk forward. That's the telltale sign of the, the, of the super. The reason this is important, and you can look at what Daigo is doing. So he throws the fireball. Okay. You see this? Daigo stops. He taps forward a little bit and then he taps forward, but he's staying in neutral, right? And the reason is because both these motherfuckers know what's about to happen, right? Daigo knows that what Justin is thinking about is the super. In order to parry the first hit of the super, of the Chun-Li super, you need to input the parry before the fucking super flash. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. So he's just sitting here waiting for it. He knows what's going to happen. Third strike has a cooldown when you input the parry and nothing happens. So he can only input so many parries. Walked back. Look at that. Look at that. Just the tap forward, tap forward, tap forward. Those are all anticipatory parries. He's putting it in in case that's when Justin does the super. Let's go, Justin. Let's go, Justin. All right. Most people in this room have probably never seen someone parry Chun-Li's entire super art, okay? Certainly not in a condition like this when you have to do it in a room full of a couple hundred people with zero health, right? And it's Daigo the Beast doing this stuff. 
there's something really important here, which is that Chun Li Super R2 Hoyoku Sen does a different number of hits against Shoto's as it does during other uh, as it does against other characters. I want to say it's so. This is what. Let's see. Oh, shit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it skips a hit. I think it does eight against normal characters, normal character widths or something. I want to say it's a function of character width. I don't quite remember. So we know that Daigo knows at this point, even though most of the people watching in this room don't know, that Chun Li Super has a different number of hits against Shoto's than against other characters. Then he jumps up to catch the last hit. And again, this is one thing which I had never seen. You didn't see me doing this today. You saw me just uh, just yeah. regular pairing the last hit, right? Why does he do this? Well, there are two reasons. One is, so he gets the jump in, right? If we go back and if we, if we go and let the whole combo rock, right? You'll see that it kills, right? I don't know what the exact numbers are, but it is entirely likely that it would it would not have killed if he hadn't got this jump in. But there's actually something even more interesting about this. And I wanna, let's see, let's see if I can find a good frame. There we go. If you look at this attack, right, you might not see anything unusual about it at first. It's Ken doing his jumping roundhouse, right? Um, let's take a look at what Ken's neutral jump roundhouse looks like. I'm gonna pull it up real quick in this handy dandy hitbox viewer. Uh, let's see. How do you play Ken in the third strike? All right. So we got neutral jumping. So Street Fighter is an interesting one because Street Fighter games traditionally give characters different attacks for neutral jump as it does for forward and back, right? Mm -hmm. So neutral jump roundhouse. If we pull it up. Let's see. Uh, Let's see where oh come on how do i how do i get it to do the thing give me one second oh i'm that's a different tool that's why i'm confused all right uh so we got ken here we're gonna look through for his neutral jumping around here we go so his neutral jumping around house right? You, you just saw Daigo do a neutral jump and do a heavy kick. What does Ken's neutral jump roundhouse looks like? Look at that. Look at this attack, right? You see, you see how high its hitboxes are? Mm -hmm. That attack is not what he's doing here. Something which I didn't realize until I had a friend explain it to me. Shouts to LB. Uh, look at that. That's not his neutral jump roundhouse, even though we clearly saw Daigo do a neutral jump roundhouse. What attack is that? Well, it happens to be his jump forward roundhouse, okay? Jump forward roundhouse looks like this. The hitboxes are lower, right? It's, it's much harder to hit this deep neutral jump roundhouse because it goes up, right? It hits above Ken. It's meant as more of an, an air to air, right? So how did Daigo get, get jump forward roundhouse if he didn't jump forward? Well, apparently he knows that if you neutral jump and parry, that forward input, for whatever reason, makes the game think, oh, you jumped forward. Let me give you the, the, the jump forward roundhouse instead. Whoa. If Daigo had pressed neutral jump or had gotten the regular neutral jump roundhouse here, it probably would not have worked. And then he does the combo into the DP, into the super to kill. I am back here somewhere. I am probably choking on my fucking Carl's Jr. Famous star combo with cheese into Dr. Pepper or whatever it was. Um, I am sitting there fucking 19, barely 19 years old. Two, it's unadulterated madness. Uh, I'm sitting here and this is the first time that I've ever been in a room full of people and I just hear that crescendo 
right? Just play it one more time. I hope someone at home watching this is watching it with headphones on, because that's the closest I can imagine approximating. That. It's that last, that last, oh, it's over. He did it. It's done. To be standing in that room, to have gotten up on your feet for a game that you don't give a fuck about and you wish everyone was playing CBS 2 or Guilty Gear instead. <laughs> and just be like, this entire room is going ape shit because one dude is really good at video games. Life changing. If there is anything that I can point to in my life as the reason why I have the conviction to spend my entire life on fighting games, it's because I was there, right? That is the Lollapalooza of a generation of fighting game players. Yeah. Um, and uh, there, there is no other way to describe it. It is bittersweet because I don't really like the game that much, but no <laughs> other game could have created Evo Moment 37, right? And that's mm. kind of what makes it amazing. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> I, should, I should cut that up, put it on YouTube. That was good. That was some good stuff. Um, but yeah, third strike, baby. Take your first pick, 109876. I think that's it. that's really beautiful, Pat. I love hearing I I love hearing your appreciation for a game that you don't like very much, <laughs> uh, and your like understanding of its significance. You know, like that it like you know this game. I don't know. There's there's something really beautiful and I think really important about like both of us have worked as like journalists and and critics in some ex extent for a long time. In addition to like our other kind of like. Uh, you know, professional artistic pursuits. Mm -hmm. um, and the ability to, like, look at something that you genuinely, like, have, like, kind of, like, a fundamental issue with um, about, like, your appreciation for it and, like, what you think that it creates. Um, but also be able to see how it's able to generate this, like, really beautiful thing for somebody else at the same oh. time mm -hmm. um, is, like... I think that's 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 a kind of like masterful just shows that you are a true journalist in a lot of ways. You know, you've got that critical like you've got that critical thinker's mindset. Um always beautiful to see your analysis from that lens. Especially it's like I couldn't believe that Third Strike was that good if somebody who didn't like Third Strike could talk so eloquently about like why that game support. <laughs> don't get me wrong third strike is a fucking piece of shit but <laughs> even pieces of shit can you, you, you like can still create awesome moments right like Absolutely. i hate this yeah. game for I, that's that's an exaggeration i hated it back then because it wasn't what i wanted to play and i didn't want to play it because it didn't make me smart and it didn't make me feel good and the reason it didn't do that was because i didn't want to do the kinds of things that you have to do mm -hmm. in order to play a game well and in order to make a moment like that but I cannot deny that that doesn't stop other people from being able to make it look really fucking cool when they're good at it, right? Um, I love fighting games deeply in my soul, right? The reason that I was playing Third Strike, even though I didn't like it, is because I would rather play a fighting game than a not fighting game, right? And that's true almost across the board. If we, mm -hmm. if you and I walked into a, a room, AV, let's say we were, we were at... <clears throat> um, God, God help us. Let's say we were at E3. <laughs> you and I are signed up for an exclusive press briefing, right? We are the only human beings that get to walk into this room. And Capcom has grace, graciously allowed us, for whatever reason, to sit down and play the new Monster Hunter. But they have a third strike cabinet right next to it as just like a thing, right? Like just because they're bored or, you know, it's kind of it's the decor for the booth, right? Uh, maybe they're doing some fun collab where they put some like third strike homage in, in Monster Hunter. And they're like, hey, wouldn't it be funny? I will sit down. And I will play third strike with you until our time is up. And they'll be like, excuse me, we're, we'd, we'd really like to show you Monster Hunter. I'd be like, nah, I'm, I'm good. Thanks, though. Right? Uh, <laughs> like, 
it is I, I think of I think of fighting games as, as a, a very similar I, I think of them as kind of like rock and roll right where like uh, a lot of it is in the moment it's about this raw human experience right with rock and roll it's being in this fucking it's not just being like in the big stage right in the crowd or whatever it's also about being in these small sweaty fucking damp ass like basement venues where it's echoing everywhere and and you know people are just kind of standing around mm. but you're there for mm. that feeling right and you go and you mm. might not give a fuck about the band you might actually think that there are things that you fundamentally disagree with about how the band makes music, about what they stand for, right? And you will hate them with a passion that only comes from being right next to each other in some kind of, right, you know, like yeah. neighboring sub-communities and niche communities in this, uh, in this, in this, you know, like uh, uh, this genre, right? Like you, and, 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 and you're like, you got, you hate them because they got 95% of it right. You agree about 95%. Right, yeah, But yeah, it's yeah. this one stupid thing that you're like, and this is why you got so far and then you made the worst thing in the world and now I have to suffer for it, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, fight, fighting games are, are very much like that for me, right? And this, this is probably like, especially because I know we got some folks who are newer to fighting games in the audience, folks who haven't been around for literal decades, like this old man here, right? When you hear the influencers talking shit about this or that or this other thing, right? This is an extension of a long history of talking shit about games that we didn't like back in the day because we didn't want to learn them. We didn't want to get good at them. Maybe you learn the bare minimum only to spite people who like the game but suck at it, right? That's That was a lot of, of the meta. That's why I'm learning Happy Chaos and Strive right now. <laughs> yeah, old old habits die say. hard. Uh, <laughs> um, but like... There, there, some of it is like you're putting down this thing because you want people to, to partake in the thing that you think is better. Because if more people partake in that thing, then you, you'll see, they'll see the, that the truth was in front of them all the time. And your thing gets a little bit more valuable because more people think it's cool, right? Um, mm -hmm. And by and large, there, there are certain, I would not recommend this as a way to approach life or fighting games in general. However, you should know that like when you hear the influencers out there of which i am unfortunately one because i guess i have i have successfully <laughs> propagated certain third strike uh truths across the world right you should know that where it comes from is it may sound like a place of hate right but it's hate in the way that you might hate your siblings when you raz them yeah right yeah, yeah. it's like it's from such familiarity and ultimately, if you dig down deep enough, it comes from a place of love. But if you, if you don't, if you're not there, if you don't see it, if you don't feel it the way that, that we feel it, you know, when, you, when you've kind of been there, when you've seen the game that you dislike dethrone the game that you love with all your heart, the game that got you into all this shit, right? You haven't felt that bitterness, then it, it might be hard to understand why people bring such, such venom and such malice uh, or what feels like venom and malice um, to conversations about what video game people play, right? That's why it's it's really just because you look at this and you're like, I actually agree with ninety five percent of this, and the last five percent just feels like anathema, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I like that step and razor. I don't know if you coined that or someone else said that, but the narcissism of small differences—that's a good way to put it. Anyway, oh, that is a good one. 